Welcome, everyone, to the Zorch Podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. I am Chris Zorch, and on today's show, we have a true Notre Dame legend, first-round draft pick, an NFL college and football analyst, and I'm not sure how many people know about this one, currently an MBA student. We have the Brady Quinn. Sir, welcome very much to the show. Chris, thanks so much for having me on, man. I've been able to watch a number of these that you've done. You do a fantastic <laughs> job. And be, be, beyond that, it, I mean, honestly, and I said this to you before we started up, but I mean it. You know, it, it's special to put on that that golden helmet because of so many of the greats that came before you. You were obviously one of those people a lot of guys looked up to, a lot of, you know, that kind of tone setter uh, just, and just the way you played, setting the example for generations to come. So uh, thank you. For, for setting the example for a lot of young guys who came after you. Well, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. And coming from you, that's a huge honor. And actually, it's really interesting. And we'll, we'll obviously get into this part. But back in 05, I was fortunate enough to have a chance to speak at the pep rally um, when you guys played USC. And that was just an amazing, amazing experience. But we'll actually get to that. The first thing I want to talk about, though, is this NBA. I mean, you, you are a grown man, um, you have children, you have a family, you have a job, and apparently yeah. you're going back to school. Please tell us about that. Yeah, so um, back last uh, last spring, when there was a lot of uncertainty with what was going to happen due to COVID, I wasn't sure we were going to have a football season. And at that point in time, I was thinking to myself, I'd like to continue my education. A lot's happened since I graduated in 07, right? We had a a housing market crash. Um, we obviously have had our economy impacted by COVID uh, in a big way. And I thought it'd be a great time to continue my education, keep learning. And so I looked for some different programs that fit within my potential you know, work and personal life. And I found that Babson College was one of those that made a lot of sense for me. I kind of have more of an entrepreneurial spirit anyway. And they're one of the top schools in that regard. And so it, it ended up working out. And uh, I'm about a year into it now. Uh, wow. I've been able to manage it, but it's been fantastic. The faculty there is fantastic. Uh, I've been very pleased so far with, with the decision to go back, but also just how I've been able to apply it to a lot of the things I'm doing professionally and personally outside of the whole broadcasting realm. Sure. And that's, that is awesome. And that, that's really kind of encouraging. I had a chance to go back after my career, and it was hard. So I can't yeah. imagine – and I, I didn't have a family at the time, so I can't imagine having a family and trying to be responsible. Oh, man. it's You have to understand, like, the kids are coming in sometimes because a lot of things got moved to Zoom or WebEx is actually the platform we use because of COVID. And so I've got, like, kids coming up and yelling at me and stuff and people oh. in the class are looking at me. And, and, and like, I'm not that old. I turned 37 later on this year. <laughs> but, but compared to a lot of MBA students now, Sure. Uh, these these kids are young. You know, they go into the workforce, maybe have a couple years of experience, then want to try to go climb that corporate ladder so they go to get their MBA. And so I feel like the old man in the room. You know, and it's very seldom I find someone, a counterpart who's close in age or who has a family that kind of understands uh, a lot of the rigorous schedule that you're going through. With, you know, having kids and trying to you know juggle everything going on. But it's 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 been fun, honestly. It's. Uh, it, it's actually been um, kind of energizing. Like when you're around young people uh, who are just starting out on their journey and, sure. and they're like trying to figure it out. It's, it's really neat to see what like younger generations, uh, their ideas, how they see things, just their perspective. It's, it's almost like hitting like a refresher. So it, it's been unique in that way. That's great. I, I remember when, when I went back, one of the things I went back to law school at Notre Dame and, one of the interesting things I found was in kind of the opposite of what you're saying, it was more for me, it was more kind of their life experience really consisted of their parents paying for everything, their education, yeah. you know, pizza money, everything else. And so unfortunately their, their, their views were a little skewed because they figured mom and dad would always bail them out. But I mean, laws a little, a little different than, than, you know, the, the, the business world. No doubt. No doubt. Now, there's, a, there's a lot of that, too, though. I mean, you see 
the uniqueness of your path or, you know, when you start talking about management or leadership skills, a lot of times they're things that come kind of naturally or inherently, you know, to us, I think as athletes or understanding how to work together with a team or communicate, you know, sports to me are, are the best uh, teacher in that growing up. And so that's been a big thing, I think, for me is just being able to, you know, take a lot of those lessons I learned in football and then really help share them with a lot of other students or even sometimes faculty mm. uh, and talking about a lot of the different experiences that I've been through. So it, it's at, at times it's almost a give and take. But, you know, I think in, in the end, as long as like everyone's learning and able to take something from it, it's, it's obviously uh, going to be well received. That is terrific. Well, you know, I like to kind of go back now because we're talking about a kid growing up in Dublin, Ohio. Like, did you figure you'll, you'll, I mean, obviously, I don't know what, what you dreamt about as a kid, but not only playing in the NFL, but like literally getting paid to like commentate on it. I mean, what was, what was that journey like as a kid kind of growing up and playing sports? In my bedroom when I was a kid, I had two things. I had a Notre Dame trash can, one of those like taller cylinder ones that, you know, you'd always be <laughs> shooting trash into or something. And then I had this, this gift. It was a, it was a picture of this the state or the uh, scoreboard and the Brown state of the old municipal lot. And it said, Brown's welcome Brady Quinn. Someone had got it for me for my no birthday. Way. And so those are the only two things that kind of had up in my room were sports related. And as I grew older, um, I started my dad, obviously, he went to Colorado. He was then uh, ended up going to serve as a, as a Marine in Vietnam. His okay. family moved. He finished um, at Ohio State in Columbus because they had moved to Columbus at that point in time. Okay. Uh, so that's where he kind of grew roots. And that's where obviously I was born in, in Dublin. But it was something about like the gold helmets when I was young, you know, Colorado and Notre Dame. And then obviously, you know, the older I got, the more I started to really appreciate what the school st stood for, clearly from a football standpoint, but academically, spiritually, all of that. Sure. Uh, but it's just crazy how it worked out because in the end, you know, I end up going to play for Notre Dame and then getting drafted by the Cleveland Browns. So I'm a huge believer for like little kids, man, like parents <laughs> all the time. I'm like, look, man, like, like breathe it into existence, like, uh. like put up put up posters, put up goals, put whatever it is, like give, give your children things to dream about at night when they're sitting and looking around the room, they can't fall asleep. Uh, Cause that, those are the two things I was looking at was Notre Dame and, and the Cleveland Browns. And it just so happened. That's crazy. That, that is, that is amazing. So, but, but as a kid playing sports, were you involved in kind of every sport imaginable or, yeah. you know, yeah, God bless my parents, man. It was football, baseball, basketball. I mean, from the time I was nine years old, they were all travel sports. I mean, we were in Des Moines, Iowa for a baseball tournament. I got picked up by another team to go be uh, in, a, in an all-star game out in Iowa. I mean, every single you know year, I think my, my older sister has a summer birthday. And so we'd always be celebrating it somewhere on the road. Like it was <laughs> Iowa when, when she was 10. It was Tennessee when she was oh 11. God. When I was 12, I think we were down in Florida for, at the Disney Wide World Sports for that tournament. Like it was always something. But she made up for it when she got into high school, having you know, a little bigger parties then. But um, <laughs> it was always football, baseball, basketball. So okay. that's all I knew growing up as far as sports. And then once I got into high school, um, I played AU basketball. But then I, um, I, I continued to play football and baseball, obviously for the school. Okay. Were you, was it kind of a situation where, um, I mean – you had one favorite or did you just kind of do it to kind of stay in shape for the other one? No, I loved them all. I mean, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm the type of kid. I'm just competitive. I mean, I just, I, it doesn't matter if we're playing tiddly winks or anything, man. Like I tell my girls all the time, like I, I don't let them, I don't let them beat daddy until, until they really start crying <laughs> and tears start coming out. Then I, then I might let them have one, but I feel like there's a lot of lessons in losing and there's a lot of lessons in competition. And oh, so I, I'm really yeah, trying absolutely. to, I'm trying to hone that in at a young age on these girls because there's just not a lot of that anymore with the participation trophies and all that stuff. So um, I'm doing my best I can to kind of teach them how to lose and how to learn sure. from losing and so they could be better the next time. But yeah, for me, it was all about just competing, you know, whatever sport. And I, I like, I loved hitting. I loved pitching in baseball and okay. basketball. Um, you know, I played more of a small forward shooting guard. So 
I, I, you know, I typically played off the ball a lot, you know, loved playing good defense, rebounding, and obviously setting up like a jumper from wherever I needed to be. And then football was always quarterback um, from the time I was in fourth grade moving forward. Mm. Was it something that, I mean, was it like kind of, hey, these are these are the positions that are available? And you're like, hey, I'm going to get in this line. Like, no, nah, I think you're more of a quarterback. Well, I wanted to play linebacker. Like, like what, what, was, what was that? Do you remember? Yeah. So actually, when I was young, because obviously my dad was a huge baseball fan. Okay. So he, when he would have me throw in the backyard, he taught me how to pitch. Uh, we had this next door neighbor too. Um, I think the last name was Connors. But he would come over and he'd watch. He'd try to work on me. At nine years old, we're doing this, right? And I remember my dad measured off 60 and a half feet like it was the major leagues. And I'm, and, and like, I'm like, Dad, like we only pitch at 45. He's like, don't worry about it. And so he would put down a piece of firewood, and that's what I used as my rubber. But we always just kind of flew uh, through uh, flat at 60 and a half feet. So you can imagine when I get out there on the mound and when I'm at 45 feet, I'm throwing the ball really hard as a 9, 10, 11 year old. Now, eventually, everyone starts to catch up. You need an out pitch, right. you got to have better location. But okay. when I was young, I was blown ball by people. That's why teams would pick me up to go play an all star game. Wow. So that naturally led to football, where the first year I was a wide receiver. I loved Jerry Rice. Like, Jerry was like my favorite player when I was young, like right. that. Um, and then, but the problem was they wanted me to play quarterback, but we, it was one of those rules where, like, the coach's son was this kid who was, like, in sixth grade, but we were in, <laughs> we were in third grade, and he was so small, but he kept – he still – you know, he was he was below that, like, weight limit, so they wouldn't let him play in the fifth, sixth grade league, so he played in the third, fourth grade. Uh, so he was our quarterback for, like, one more year, and then the next year I started playing quarterback just because of the pitching, and then the rest was history. Wow. That's – okay, so it's a – okay, you're a receiver. I, I like that. Uh, I definitely like that. So where did – I mean, who bought the basket? Who bought the trash can? Where did it, Do you even remember where it came from? Or literally – because, of course, I'm going to ask you kind of what, what schools were you looking at, but where did this love from Notre Dame come from? I think it was a family friend, um, honestly, who, who bought it for us. I can't remember who bought the trash can. Um, I want to say it was the Warners, another, like, family friend in the neighborhood. I, I grew up in, like – the greatest neighborhood that you would ever want to grow up in as a young kid. That's I probably like. had kids who were like anywhere between a year younger to like four years older, like, and like probably 15 of us, all boys, like we just all got together and played in everyone's backyard. That was like looped together. Mm. And it was the best man after school. Like that's what we did for two hours till it was dinner time. And, you know, someone's mom's yelling out and everyone scrambled and had to go home. But wow. um, it was the Warner family who I believe got it from uh, from like the mall, one of those kiosks at the mall <laughs> you see there selling <laughs> random things like that. Right. Uh, so, I mean, was it kind of like, you know, hey, I, okay, so, so let's fast forward a little bit. I mean, do you remember as a kid kind of watching Notre Dame games or was it just kind of like, it just? I mean, your dad went to Ohio State, so was it, kind of more of uh, more of Buckeyes or what? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, some of my earliest memories of games, like I, I very rarely remember like the national championship year like that. I remember some of the highlights and different things, but not quite as much. Um, one of the things that stood out was when we would watch Colorado, um, I'll never forget the Hail Mary uh, caught by Michael Westbrook. And, and just like that play against Michigan and all that. I remember where I was in our base and watching it and wow. just freaking out. It was like the craziest thing I'd ever seen. But it was primarily Ohio State games. I, mean, I, I okay. grew up going to watch a lot of those. Uh, I don't really remember Earl Bruce. It was more John Cooper when he got right. there. Um, but I remember going up, sitting in the cheap seats, ro- watching them lay a hundred on rice, um, wow. throwing, you know, throwing a football around in the, uh, you know, tailgating in the parking lot and all yeah. that dreaming of one day, you know, maybe playing there. So it was, uh, that was usually a team that I went and saw play. Uh, but, but again, I was kind of indifferent as far as like a fan. I just, I love being out there and watching them play. Sure. So, so when you, I mean, at, I mean, are you the, the age of like maybe, sophomore junior year are you thinking about hey you know i can get a college scholarship or was it like you know hey you know or were you kind of like freshman year on you're like hey i'm getting a college scholarship i'm going to division one i mean what was that like i really didn't know you know our high school double kaufman high school 
Uh, it's a Division One program, so the biggest division in the state of Ohio. Okay. And I really thought I was going to be baseball early on. Uh, I got pulled up early. Uh, I did I did for football as well at the end of my freshman year up to varsity, but it wasn't until the very end. Um, and, and in baseball, I was actually playing more our sophomore year. We won states, which for the state of Ohio obviously is a big deal, even though nationally it's hard to compare to some of the other southern states where you see kids playing. <laughs> right. um, but but that 2000 and what would have been 2001, like that spring and then into that junior year fall, that was probably the biggest year of my life. Um, we ended up going – our head coach got fired – my sophomore year, we went up going, I think our record was that year. I think we were six and four okay. and he got fired. And so the following year, we bring in a new head coach, a new offense, new everything. And we ended up going to the state semis, which is the furthest our, our high school had ever wow. been. And so at that point, um, even though I was getting some schools talking to me for baseball, it was it all became football. It was okay. like everything flooded in for for football at that point. And then that next summer, I had already made my my decision to go to Notre Dame, um, but but there was there was a lot that like went into that a, along the way, and, and Notre Dame really didn't come into the very end. Really? Well, well tell us yeah. about it because that that's that's amazing, man. I'm I'm well, assuming like Ohio State's like all over you. Yeah, Ohio State was Ohio State, Michigan, uh, a lot of a lot of other Big Ten schools. Uh, you know, Iowa was my first offer. Uh, so there's a number of that a, a number of them that came in. Northwestern was rolling at that point with Randy Walker. Um, and that kind of fit more of that, you know, a- academics and athletics sure. that my parents were really pushing me towards. But uh, honestly, it, it really came about because a that like kind of childhood following them, you know, growing up. And then I had um, best man of my wedding, best friend in the world, uh, named Chin- Chinadu and Duke and he moved into my hometown in seventh grade. Our families immediately wow. became really close. His eldest brother. Uh, was in ROTC, and he went to Notre Dame. He was a chemical engineer. He's now serving in the Navy. But we used to go up there, and we used to go to games, and we'd stay on him. We'd sleep on his college dorm room floor. Wow. And there was just something about it then that never really hit me. I mean, when we went up there, we were just kids watching football games, um, you know, probably at, at that age, like in eighth grade, freshman year of high school, thinking, like, we could talk to girls. Um, <laughs> but we – like, it wasn't, it wasn't a reality until – then I started playing a little bit and then Bob Davies started recruiting me. So, you know, I went up for my unofficial visits, kind of checked it out, but I had been to a number of, of kind of unofficial visits. So I, I wasn't really sure what to think of the whole process. Okay. Um, and then, you know, when it, when they went through the Bob Davies firing to George O'Leary being there, like I didn't hear from Notre Dame. Uh, and it was kind of like a dead period and Tyron Willing, Willingham came in late and I really hadn't heard from him either. So I had gone on with the process, visited a bunch of schools, um, a lot of places down throughout the South, um, you know, Tennessee, South Carolina. Uh, oh, wow. I'd been to Florida. I'd been to a, a bunch of schools. And, and back then, you know, you drove around. You know, the schools right. wanted to see you meet with you in person. You didn't have these, like, one-stop shop camps <laughs> where you go throw and then everyone starts to offer. Right. But the, the interesting thing was is, like, I remember throwing at the Michigan camp and I hadn't been to BC. I talked to Dana Bible, who was a coach there. Um, and obviously, it was a school that was on my list I was going to try to make to at some point. But like they offered me before I even really talked to many people just because of how they maybe saw me throw at another camp. So okay. um, a bunch of offers started coming in all at once. It was a little overwhelming. But it was really a trip to Colorado where I had family out there. And, you know, Gary Barnett was the head coach at the time. And, you know, it's scenic. It's beautiful. My dad had gone there initially. Uh, we had family there. So I, I thought maybe I could do that. And I'll never forget, like, just kind of a sign, maybe from God or, or however you want to put it or look at it. But when I was leaving, uh, Coach Barnett gave me this book. And it was a book about the success he had in Northwestern and how he was bringing that to Colorado. Okay. And so when, I, when I'm getting on the plane to fly back to Ohio, which is kind of a long flight, uh, I haven't opened up the book. I probably get about 30 pages in and there's a note. There's an envelope with a note in it and it's hate mail. Like someone had bought this book and they had sent it back to them and oh it basically God. saying how he was a fraud, <laughs> how all this whole entire book is, is just full of lies and everything else. Oh my and God. Yeah. And, and so I looked at it. I was like, 
this is a sign. Like I, I, I shouldn't be going here. And it, and, I, and, I, and the thing is, is I loved Coach Barnett. I loved Steve Watson. He was their quarterback coach at the okay. time. Like, I mean, I, I really did like it out there. But at that point, I was like, I don't think I'm supposed to go to Colorado. So, oh um, I kind of just went on with the process, and it ended up working out where um, Chinadu and Dukeway, who was my high school teammate, he was my go-to wide receiver. His dad came over one night. Uh, and, and he pleaded with my dad. He said, you need to go meet Ty Willingham. You need to go up there. He said, I know you're get, he's ready, getting ready to make a decision. And he's done all his visits and he's tired of traveling. But you need to drive up to South, South Bend to sit down with Ty Willingham. So I did that. And, and then, like I said, I'd been on their campus before. You know, right. back when Bob Davey recruited me. Right. When I'd gone up to see my buddy's brother. It was just different that time. And I loved everything about how Ty was as a person, as a coach. He was honest. He was truthful. And that was the type of man that I thought, I want to go play for him. I, I feel like I could get better as a player, but also as a person, wow. um, you know, you know, playing under him. And that was pretty much it. I committed, um, you know, still got recruited by Ohio State. They won the national championship that year. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there, was, there was some heavy recruiting there towards the end. Oh, um, my gosh. But uh, no, I, I I stayed I stayed true to Notre Dame and uh, and ended up signing. That's amazing. That, that's an amazing story, man. And so there's some fan out there, literally, who may be responsible for you not going to Colorado. <laughs> yeah, because they nailed this book to buy that. That's hilarious. Yeah, well, and I would just say this to that person. Thank you very much. You helped, <laughs> you helped guide me. It was maybe the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life without ever oh knowing you, so thank you. That's crazy. God, yeah. man. That's, okay, so you have a chance to, to fight for Coach Wilhelm for like one year, right? Two years. Two okay, years. two years. Yeah, All right, so. okay. So what was kind of – that like versus kind of going there because as you said, I mean, I had a chance actually um, I was in law school when coach Willingham was the coach. And so, I mean, if I was 18, 19 years old, I would have loved to play for him. Cause I thought he was, yeah. that, I mean, I spent some time with him. He is that great of a man. I mean, he would, I would have right. loved to play for him. So one, how was that experience? But then also what was it like when you had to make that transition when he got fired? Yeah, so the experience was um, it, it was it was humbling in the beginning, only because uh, there it was so much academically. It really was, um, you know. And back then, it, I was set up to graduate early and enroll early. You know, Ty really talked me talked me out of it and said, "We really don't do that. We really want you to enjoy, you know, your time with your friends and family before you go off to school." Um, which, you know, again, if I could do it all over again, I think I would have pressed as hard as I could to enroll early because. Okay. I, I needed I needed time to adjust. I needed time to learn like my process and how I prepare. Sure. Because you know I went up and trained in the summertime. I ended up running a, a house. It was somewhere on the south side of South Bend, um, and I, I ended up just work. I'd go up work out. We'd go throw, and that was it. And there was a group of our freshman class that wow. kind of did that, uh, but we weren't taking classes. So I felt like it was, right. I was kind of wasting time, even though I was learning the playbook really well. But you know, once you threw in the academic portion of things, it was tough. I mean, the first half semester for me, because I was pl I played in every game. I started my fourth game moving forward. It, it started to not be overwhelming, but you just wish you could have had, again, a little more time to prepare sure. for the workload and everything else. Right. Um, and, and I ended up figuring it out. I ended up kind of adjusting as, as the season went on, as the academic calendar went on. But it was really humbling. Like I, I wasn't as prepared as I thought I was going to be for just the time management that it took, and I think the um, really what it meant to be a Notre Dame quarterback. Like I, I don't sure. think I don't think many people really understand. Like as a true <laughs> freshman, like what it means to be in that position, right. which is like Notre Dame is the epicenter of college football. So right. um, it well, was. Well, I was I was actually going to say that. I mean, this is it's one thing. To be a student at Notre Dame, that's 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 one thing. There's one thing to be an athlete at Notre Dame, that's another thing. And it's to something totally different when you're the quarterback of Notre Dame. And oh, by the way, you're a freshman. Right. That's that's insane. Right. I mean, it was. Uh, I, I remember. You know, I I, I was in a, a dorm room with two other roommates. One was the best roommate in the world. 
Um, literally, you couldn't ask for a better roommate. I'm not going to name names, but you couldn't ask for a better roommate. <laughs> the other one was actually in ROTC, but he, I think he came from a more, a very structured household. Okay. And when he got to college, Chris, he just went he wild. lost his mind. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> This kid, like, he was asleep all day, up all night. I was oh like, dude, God. I've got a 6 a.m. lift. I've got an exam. I've got all this stuff. Uh, like, he was not the type of roommate that anyone would want to have be a part of. And the, the my other freshman year roommate was fantastic. He was the best. Like, he barely said anything, was always really helpful, kind of understanding of all of it. So that, like, kind of poured on top of it. It was like you just couldn't get a break even when you wanted to or wanted to kind of get away and be on your own for a second and like decompress. It was, it was hard to do that. So um, was, was, was there a conversation like with your dad or with anybody with coach Willingham kind of like, okay, you know, this is a lot to take as a freshman. Let's kind of ease into, I mean, what's that conversation? I mean, what, what's your support staff or what, what are your, the folks who are supporting you? What's that conversation like? Yeah. So, you know, I was too embarrassed to tell my, my parents, honestly, like I, I didn't want to tell them how bad I was doing in school. I didn't want to mm. tell them that it was becoming overwhelming just because, you know, this was, this was, you know, my decision as well right. as like, they're pushing me there, but I, I didn't want to tell them that I was struggling. And, but Ty did pull me in one day, you know, coach Wingham pulled me in and he asked me, just looked at me straight in the face and says, is this too much for you? Cause I was starting and, and, and he saw what my midterm grades were at that point. And I said, <laughs> look, I said, I just took two midterms. I did pretty well. I think the grades are going to come up. I said, I'm going to drop one of those class, one of the other classes that I'm not doing well in and I can pick it up next summer. I said, so I'll, I'll be down to 12 hours instead of 15. But like, you know, that, like, that's, that's the only thing I can tell you right now. But I was, I was just said to him, I said, happy. I'm still trying to figure this out, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm slowly starting to get the hang of it. So, mm. uh, Coach, coach was great in that regard. You know, he really did um, kind of take me under his wing. He believed in me uh, as a freshman, which is something that was really hard to do. And just as a side note, like I remember when he left, because he ended up getting fired from my sophomore year, he went out to Washington and they had a kid by the name of Jake Locker, who he had me reach out to because he reached out, Ty reached out to me and said, hey, I've got a kid who's reminds me a lot of you. Mm. Could you reach out? Could you talk to him? And so, you know, I had a number of conversations with, with Jake, but he was a great kid um, and obviously, you know, did a great job for Washington during his time there. But uh, that was one of the things I appreciated most about Coach Willingham is he really did care about the individual. It wasn't just about football or, you know, just trying to pass the grades and all that either. Wow. You are listening to the Zorch Podcast with our guest, Brady Quinn. So let's fast forward a little bit. And I mean, you, you have an illustrious career. You have, you know, a gazillion records that, that were, I think were in place until this past season, or, I mean, do you have any more records that are left at the quarterback? Oh yeah. There's, yeah there's, there's, there's definitely still some records. There's definitely oh, some nice. Records. Okay. Well, I just thought Ian Book took like, took over everybody's stuff, you know? No, he took over, he took over the wins, the, the total wins. Okay. Which, uh, I, I always joke. I mean, I was happy for him. It did take him five years in Notre Dame to get there. So. <laughs> I'm just saying. You have to give him shit for it. You got to give him shit for it. That's great. You got to give each other a hard time about it. No, I I kept in touch with him a lot this year. Uh, I told him before the season started. You know, I said, hey, man, I I know it's not easy to be the quarterback in Notre Dame, especially the longer you're there, the almost – I feel like people almost kind of take it for granted a little bit, um, what it means to be in that position, and then really when you're achieving at a high level. And it, it almost feels like it's never enough. Like, I think our society has gotten to that point too now where it's like, nothing's ever enough. Um, and I told him before the season, you know, just that one, like how happy I was going to be for him when he did it. Uh, Cause he's a kid that I followed, you know, since he first you know signed and when I'd go to campus, I would ask him, I was like, what about Ian? What about Ian? Mm-hmm. And finally, when he got a shot, you know, he, he really took off and succeeded with nice. it. So, um, it was awesome. It was awesome to see the success he was able to have over the course of his career. It really was. That is, that's, that's great. One, one quarterback talking to another. Um, so I'm just going to ask you, what was, did you have a, a kind of favorite moment, favorite game situation that you had in Notre Dame? And maybe some obscure game like against the Navy that, you know, something yeah. happened. I mean, did you have one of those? Uh, I mean, the UCLA game my senior year was always one that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I remember when we got the ball back and you just had this feeling in the stadium of just doubt. It felt heavy. Um, and, and Charlie just kind of looked at me and just said, 
there's no one who believes we're going to win this. He goes, but you and me. Wow. And he goes, you know, this is going to be our first play. And he's like, go make it happen. And I said, okay. And it, it was pretty neat. I mean, obviously, you know, the final play, Jeff, the catch and the run after the catch was spectacular, which is right. just what he did over the course of our time there together. Um, but that moment was pretty neat. And it was one where um, I kind of had a feeling just going into it. You know, I, I, I'll never forget. There was two things that like surprised me about that year that were interesting is like there was this weird rule where they'd start the game clock after like a dead ball change of possession, like on the whistle. It was, it was a one year rule that got rid of it. It was so okay. dumb. I, I have okay. no idea why they did it, but I just remember like always having to rush to go out there onto the field <laughs> and, and like, I'd be ready for the snap. Cause, Cause I was like, cause the clock's going to start and start. We've got like 50 seconds left in the game. So that, and then I, I think they punted and we ended up getting a penalty. And so then they kicked <sighs> again. And so we not only did we lose more time, we actually had worse fuel position on the other side of that punt. So I just remember thinking to myself, man, could like anything else go wrong this day? Because it was just a tough day for us in general offensively. And then uh, obviously the, the rest is kind of history. We hit a couple of passes on the sidelines. Uh, we came back with a play called um, – it was 83-10 comeback. And uh, I found Jeff across the middle and he did the rest. But that, well, that well, one memory – well, no, I, I just want to. I mean, can you kind of walk us through? Because, I mean, when the chips are down, when the fans aren't that excited, I mean, what is it like to be out? There? I mean, yes, you're not in quarterback, but I mean, you still you you want to win this game. Are you in the huddle looking at guys, looking at the face of these of your players, your old linemen, going, "We got to do this," or were they dejected? I mean, what was that like? Yeah, that's the funny thing about playing quarterback is you have such an interesting perspective. Because every – and this is what I hate about football today is they don't have a huddle anymore. I mean, when you walk into a huddle, and especially before a drive like that or, you know, that later on that year, we are on a two-minute drive to basically put us in the Fiesta Bowl against Stanford. And at that point, we had done it so many times before. It was like, all right, we got this, right? Like mm. the, the difference in their demeanor – our junior year at the end of that season, they believed that we were going to go down and score. Like they just knew wow. it was going to happen. Earlier that season, you wouldn't necessarily said that uh, my, my junior year when you started going through some of the games. Like Michigan State was a game we lost in 2005 at home. It was an overtime. But I remember we were down by like three scores. And Charlie and I had a similar conversation. And it was, it was one of those deals where like you had, to, you had to perform and you had to be the one to get everyone else to believe. And it's, mm. it, can, it can be, uh, I think, for some people, a scary spot to be in. For me, I kind of loved it. To like then be able to look back at them and say, hey, how cool is that? You know, how awesome was that we were able to do when maybe even you doubted too if you could do it or not. But right. we were able to get it done. Right. So um, that, that UCLA game stands out. Obviously, that was pretty unique, pretty neat. Uh, it's hard not to it's hard not to think about the uh, the Stanford game just because that put us in the Fiesta Bowl. And sure. um, it was a payoff for the university. But it was it was good <laughs> to get back to a BCS game right. um, for us, especially considering everything we did that year. And obviously there's the Bush Bush game, which um, it didn't end the way, you know, I think any of us wanted to. Um, there's controversy in the end, like there always seems to be with Notre Dame. But, uh, you know, when I left the field and we were up, as much as I wanted to enjoy that moment, I knew how good the guys were across the field. And I knew if just from talking to Charlie during the course of the week, like we knew whoever had the ball last would win. Like mm. we felt confident if it was us, we were going to win. But we also knew that they had, you know, Reggie Bush and they had Matt Liner and they had guys who uh, were very special, you know, being that they were the, the, the uh, defending national champs. So, um, you know, it, it ended up being what it was in the end, but it was still one of those games where it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard not to enjoy at least how it felt leaving the field the last time I was on. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, can you share with us a little bit about kind of how it felt kind of leading up to that week? I mean, did you throw the ball? Did you hold the ball a little tighter? I mean, when you guys – when you saw each other on campus, you guys, did you give that nod of assurance? I mean, what, what was it like kind of leading up? Because I had never been, and, and we won some games when I was there, but I had never been. The night before, they had a freaking pep rally in the damn stadium. That shit was it – was, it was like um, it was Texas A&M yeah. when, when they got that – when, when like 100,000 people in the stadium before the game. I mean, it was nuts. So, I mean, what was, what was the hype around that game? You give me chills just talking about it, man. I mean, honestly, like that's that's how I feel. Like it, I, you know, I remember walking 
off this little practice and it being a Tuesday and being like, dude, there's always already people outside. Like there's people asking for autographs. There's people rocking around campus. Like you felt this electricity, you know, you felt this energy from the students. You felt it from when you went to the dining hall, you felt like everyone's looking at you at all times. Like mm. you, you just, you always felt like there was eyes on you the whole time. And you're kind of like, man, this feels good. Like this, this feels like, this feels like this is how it's supposed to be. Like, this is why I came wow. to Notre Dame for big games like this. Um, and, and I'll never forget, you know, there was multiple pep rallies. So there was obviously the one you mentioned in the stadium, which was just nuts. I mean, I, I remember walking into it. Like when you, when you walk through, when you walk down the tunnel for the first time and you're looking through, you know, the prism of, of your face mask, like I'll never forget that Washington state, my freshman year, but I'll also never forget the pep rally before that game because I, I i wasn't it's like you've never seen it before and then once you walk into it you're going oh my gosh all these people showed up for a pep rally like not a game a pep rally <laughs> and i was just like i was so taken back by it. it probably took me about two minutes to realize like man this is this is cool this is special um and then there was a pep rally on the quad the night before the south quad and I remember I went and spoke at that right outside of, of, of Dillon Hall, which is my dorm. And I remember how many people were out there then. And I was giving out USC's hotel, the phone number. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was, I was trying to make sure everyone knew, like, when to call, you know, just because they were trying to adjust to central time zone, these West Coast boys. Um, but it, it, re it really did feel electric. It, it, was, it was unlike any other week. And that stadium was unlike any other time uh, during during my time there, in Notre Dame. Mm. Mm. The, the, so when you think about your experience, kind of at Notre Dame, um, I mean, being a record holder, having a chance to kind of walk in the the bright lights as a freshman, I mean, what's your your, your fondest memory uh, of Notre Dame? Man, yeah, that's a tough one because. You know, I don't know that it was anything necessarily on the field. Um, it was probably different moments in time with my teammates in the locker room. Like I, I talked about the Stanford two minute drive, but what a lot of people don't realize is when Charlie came into the locker room after that that game, and I'll never forget too, because they actually, they renovated that stadium. So we left the field, there was no joke bulldozers, bull, like you could hear the beeping and what? literally getting ready to knock down the stadium as soon as we left. Like it, oh that was how fast. God. They started construction, but in the locker room, I'll never forget Charlie coming in there and he just started to get everyone excited and started dancing. And it was just fun. I mean, cause he was not the type of coach to do something like that. So when he started dancing, everyone started going nuts and they're so excited about it and making plans for the Fiesta bowl, uh, just cause that's where we anticipated we were going. Um, but honestly, I remember the last pep rally that we had my senior year. Um, you know, when your parents are there, right. it's the last time you're doing something like this. And, and obviously I knew I was going to play football in the future, but this was one of those unique things that you just, you don't experience ever again. There's nothing ever, ever like it. And it was my last one. And just um, the reception that I got, because they call out each senior, uh, that was something that was truly special. You know, mm. when you, when you see that you're, you're all your hard work, your dedication, your sacrifices are, are appreciated. Um, and your parents are there to experience it with you. Like that was right. a pretty neat moment. Right. Well, and I forgot, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, how was, was that transition with um, from Ty to coach Weiss? I mean, did he call you up and just say, you know, Hey, this is what happened. Let's move forward. I mean, Hey, you know, what, what was that like? It was honestly really tough uh, because Ty was someone who I got to play for. And, mm -hmm. you know, you always think in your head, okay, I'm going to go to play, you know, at this school, but not necessarily for the coach because, you know, we know they can leave. We know sure. they can get fired, all those sorts of things. So I tried to have that mindset, but, like, the reality of it is I took ownership. Like, I didn't play well enough. We didn't play well enough. We were a young football team, and – we pulled off a couple of top 10 upsets, but we gave up leads to Pitt, BC and lost those games. You know, if we, be, if we win those two games, he's he was probably still the head coach. Mm. So I took a lot of accountability or responsibility for it. Um, it, it was frustrating knowing that we were a young team. We were only going to get better the more we got to play. Um, and, and so the transition was very drastic. I mean, 
Charlie and Ty are two completely different with how they communicated, how they handled things. You know, one was a West Coast offense that was very much based upon footwork, timing, rhythm. Uh, the the New England Patriots offense isn't so much built like that. It's it's really predisposed to play specific, um, you know, and how your footwork is going to be tied to that specific play. Uh, there's a lot more that was put on my plate, which was great. Um, obviously, it, it allowed me to excel, allowed us right. to excel offensively. Um, I mean, shoot, the first playbook I ever got was a Patriots playbook. So um, <laughs> it was fun to be able to sit there and watch all spring Tom Brady, you know, the, the greatest to ever do it and say, OK, this is what I'm trying to mimic. I am trying to do what the greatest of all time is, right. is doing, you know, throughout these concepts, throughout practice. So um, that was it was a great experience, but it was definitely very different as far as how both those two coached, how they communicated, how they handled things for sure. So was it a situation where, I mean, there was a, a last team meeting that Ty had, and then, I mean, obviously they didn't walk past each other in the hallway, but um, I've been through a coaching change on a professional level, and it's a little hairy. I mean, you know, you sit there and say, you know, wow, you know, and you're of that age where you're still impressionable. I mean, was it like, wow, you know, let's just give them another chance, or was it like, you know, hey, we have to move on. And oh, by the way, this is who we got. Okay, he looks really good on paper. Maybe we can do something. So Kevin White, who was our athletic director at the time, he had put together what we call kind of a leadership council. Okay. So we had players who were kind of deemed as leaders at their individual positions based on their years. And they, um, we, all, we all would meet with Kevin White periodically. And so the thing about Charlie was we had already been introduced to Charlie. Charlie came in the spring leading into our sophomore year. So um, he came in like the year before he got hired okay. to consult with our, our offensive coaching staff. Oh, wow. Okay. And he spoke to our team during a Saturday morning workout in the spring. And full disclosure, I mean, he reamed us out. I mean, he tore us a new one. And so when Kevin White was like, hey, here are the, here are the candidates that we're looking at. And he said, Charlie Weiss, we were like, it's like thinking about that substitute teacher who right. comes in and gives you a tongue lashing because you try to take advantage when you're when your teacher's right. got the day off sure and then she comes back in the second time you're like oh i can't really push her buttons so um that was kind of the initial reaction and then you know kevin was great kevin white was unbelievable he you know he allowed us to, to actually talk to coach weiss before the hire was official uh, we got to ask him questions. We got to talk to him about some things. And, you know, Charlie made very clear kind of like what the expectations were and he was going to put a lot on my plate. So I really didn't have time to think about whether or not I was buying in. Uh, to me, it was a, a perfect situation for me, given the offense he was going to run and then how, um, you know, things are going to operate. So I just bought in right away. And I think there's a lot of other guys who kind of realized too, that they had to buy in all you know right away, otherwise we weren't going to have a chance at, at immediate success or being right. able to go to a BCS game that next year. You're listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest Brady Quinn. So you have a chance to have a ton of success at Notre Dame. Um, what was your your draft day like? I mean, you mentioned before <laughs> you knew you had a chance. I mean, there's probably no snowball's chance in hell that you're going to go to your favorite team. And I'm sure at one point you obviously want to go to any team that wants you, but the idea that you have a chance to actually get drafted, but what was that experience like? Were you in New York? Were you at home with your family? I mean, what was it like? Yeah, I was in New York. So okay. I had the opportunity to go to New York, um, had some other stuff that was going on off the field from a marketing standpoint. So I already had some commitments, but then, you know, once you, you commit to go to New York for the draft, you know, they've, they've got basically, Back then, it was a Saturday, Sunday, uh, and they've got things lined up for you from basically about Tuesday to Friday. I mean, it's all day. Like, you're in a bus at 7, you get back to the hotel at 5. You're doing appearances, community events, hospital visits, different things like that. Um, and, and so we were doing that. There was I forget how many of us went, but we were doing that for, like, the entire week. So um, – that was kind of what my week was like. And then in the nighttime, I would try to meet with my family. I had a bunch of family who came uh, oh. to New York. Some of it was the only time they went, you know, only time <laughs> they'd been, only time they'll ever go. Um, so 
they enjoyed themselves. It was definitely uh, a first and, and maybe the last for some of them. But uh, draft day for me was interesting because I, I, I ended up going uh, at 22, which, you know, is a blessing when you think about it. But there was an expectation that I was going to go a lot higher. And right. I think the tough thing was is, you know, the Browns told me the night before if both Joe Thomas and I were still there at three, they were going to take Joe. And my agent at the time was like, well, I don't know how to take this because no one's ever been honest and uh, ever told me this before. Right. right. But Phil Savage was the general manager. He knew like how much I, I cared about the Browns and, and he knew how much I cared about going and playing there. And so he wanted to be honest with me. Like he took the risk of mm. telling me the truth of how things were going to play out wow. just because he cared like how I was going to react. So, Which is very rare, uh, which is uh, extremely rare. <laughs> extremely rare. And it, it, it speaks volumes about the person he is. You know, he's now with the Jets organization, but he's one of the best people in this business. And it just so happened like they came back to get me at 22. Um, but I hadn't, meet with, I hadn't met with a team outside the top 10. So, you know, once – once the Dolphins passed on me at nine, it was like, all right, like what's what's going to happen from here on out? Because now there's not really a, a group of teams that need a quarterback. Um, so it ended up uh, it ended up being the 22nd pick, and I was I, I remember sitting there. I was in Roger Goodell's suite at this point. Um, they'd have the TV on me so much. He had asked at one point somewhere in the teens, like, "Hey, would you want to come back? And get out of the, <laughs> get out of the get out of the green room." And come in and come in my suite. And I, and I said, look, uh, I'm not going to take you up on that right away, but I may take you up on that later on. And really one of the reasons why, and I tell people this all the time, what I realized was the mistake I made was I knew what I was signing up for. And then I knew the consequences of if I didn't get drafted, the camera's just going to be sitting there on me the whole time because <laughs> I'm the only player left. Like, <laughs> you start panning around that room oh. with no one else there. Oh my so God. That's, that's the risk you run. Uh -huh. But what I didn't realize was my family wasn't prepared for that. You know, I had oh, grown okay. up in the spotlight. Right. So right. they didn't feel comfortable about it. They didn't mm. want to be on camera. They didn't, you know, they don't know how to, they don't know how to handle and man, you know, manage their emotions. So sure. at some point in the late teens, I kind of, you know, cause back then the picks were like 15 minutes a piece or whatever they were. Right. Um, and so I went to Roger and said, Hey, maybe I'm gonna take up on that offer. If you don't mind, if my family comes and sits down. So um, we're sitting in there. And I get a call from the Baltimore Ravens. They're trading up at 23 with the Kansas City Chiefs. And they're going to take me with the next pick. And so I'm talking to Ozzie Newsom. I'm talking to Brian Billick. I'm talking wow. to Rick Neuheisel. Like all these guys that I hadn't spent any time with over the course of the process. Right. And just kind of getting acquainted and all that. And kind of getting excited, to be honest with you, when you think about how good that organization you know, really has been. So um, I hang up the phone. There's about two minutes left in the first round or that, in that 22nd pick. And I get a call from a 216 number. And next thing I know, someone's like, hey, it's the Browns. So-and-so with the Browns, we're going to be taking you. Like people are pulling me up off the couch and rushing me out on the stage. You know, oh Joe, 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 Theismann's, Joe Theismann's ripping me for like not – like looking so disheveled. And I was like, dude, if you knew how many people dragged me off the couch – like trying to figure out what's happening right now, oh just threw God. me a hat, and and I was like, okay, like we're here, we're we're on the stage, we're getting drafted. So uh, it was it was it was a whirlwind um, of just emotions in that like five minute span, from thinking you're getting drafted by Baltimore and thinking to yourself, I can't wait to go back in and kick Cleveland's ass. To then Cleveland drafting <laughs> you, and now you're going, oh, all right, I gotta flush away those emotions. Now I'm actually going to play for the Browns. So it's um it was. It was a pretty crazy whirlwind, pretty crazy day. Uh, but in the end, it was obviously great to be drafted by a team you grew up rooting for and, and grew up dreaming to go play at. Well, that's what I want to talk about. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough that happened to me, but that, that that doesn't happen to a lot of people. I mean, I wasn't wow. a young kid with a poster on my board that said, you know, the Browns welcome Brady Quinn. So do you still have that poster? Does, does it still exist somewhere or did it get shoveled in moves and – Everything it's, else. um, it is in a, I believe this big Fisher price football that my grandfather got me <laughs> along with this Bernie Kozar, um, uh, Jersey. I had this oh whole little Bernie cars, helmet, Joe Jersey and, and pants. <laughs> and, um, I think it's somewhere in my mom's house. Oh, that's uh, crazy. In storage, that yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah. so, so what, I mean, crazy world went on draft day. I mean, at one point, 
maybe it wasn't that evening or maybe it was at two o'clock in the morning. Did you have a time by yourself and just say, holy shit, like, like what just happened? And oh my God, I'm playing for my childhood team. I mean, did you ever have a moment like that? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, the next day, because I ended up flying that day to pick up Joe Thomas. We actually went from New York to Wisconsin. We grabbed Joe, his family, and we both flew in to Cleveland together. Okay. And Joe and I know each other a little bit from a, a high school American game. Um, okay. We played with each other on the same team. So I knew a little bit about him that, from that. So we got reacquainted. But that night, I mean, it was hard to sleep. I just kept thinking to myself, like, all right, like I need to get my hands in the playbook. I need to, I need to get going. I need to get preparing. Like I knew rookie minicamp was coming up soon. So I never really had a chance to fully internalize it um, until we went through the press conference, met a lot of people in the facility. And then my parents and I were kind of driving around, just looking at different neighborhoods, maybe places where I was going to try to live. And I remember being like, my dad looked at me and he was just like, man, can you believe this? I was like, <laughs> I, was like I, I, I can now. I was like, yeah, when, when it was happening, I was like, pinch me. Someone pinch me. Tell, uh, me. tell me what's happening right now. Wow. That is, that is just amazing. So you had a chance to play for several years. I mean, do you have a memorable moment? And again, you know, this is a moment that I'm looking for, just kind of like something that no one may not know or, or they may know, but just kind of did you come back from a game, your first game starting? I mean, what was – do you have a memory like that? Yeah, I mean, my, my, so my rookie year, I didn't get to play uh, really till the end. And okay. uh, there was two things that stood out. We were playing San Francisco week, week 17. Our 16th game was week 17. We are playing San Francisco at home. It was freezing. I mean, when I say freezing, like, like South Bend's cold, but you don't get the same quite type of lake effect, you know, like you do in Cleveland, and like, and you know from like Chicago, like, right. like Chicago's even a little bit. It's got like that wind coming off the lake, like it's got a little nippiness to it. Um, so I remember uh, our quarterback Derek Anderson. He like hit his hand or finger. He needed to go to the locker room get checked out, and so I get like thrusted in. And I was freezing. I was, I was stiff. I was freezing. I hadn't played all season since preseason. Oh and I was God. like, all right, let's 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 see what happens. But I remember <sighs> going into that game, it was gonna be Bryant Young's last game. And I was wow. a big Bryant Young fan. And I forget how many he played forever. So right. I just remember thinking as we broke the huddle, like looking down and going, Oh my gosh, that's Bryant Young. <laughs> like I, I, I in that moment, I almost wanted to be like like by what's up man like <laughs> and i was like oh wait, wait, wait. Yeah, then i was like oh we gotta finish this out like, um so I, i'll never forget first snap they bring a double corner blitz and we had this like like the backside route was an isolation route it was dead it wasn't good to burst that coverage and then on the front side we had like your little typical frisco combination so you had a flat route a little uh a six yard uh, some people call it a little hook some people call it a return and then with your flag route. Um, and I remember I, as I was driving back, I was like, oh, my feet feel like I'm in cement. Like I felt so <laughs> stiff and so heavy. And I remember I got back and top my drop and I was like trying to just, just float the ball over the blitzing cornerback to okay. the fullback because the little uh, return route was covered. And it, like, it just got over, but then it just sailed a little bit on me. I was like, okay. And I was like, all right, all right, like, let's regroup now. Let's regroup. So we ended up, I ended up hitting a couple third down conversions, got us down there, hit Kellen Winslow, man, right between the eight and the zero, and he dropped a touchdown pass. Oh. So we, so we settled for a field goal, but like jogging off, I was just like, okay, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't great, but like we got points and like, it, it, it gave me a lot of like kind of boost and confidence in that season. I think the worst part was, is we ended up going 10 and six. We didn't make the playoffs. Hmm. And so that led to like the next year, you know, Derek Anderson had a great year that year. He actually had a pro bowl year. So, you know, he was a starter going into the season right. and we start off the season. Things don't, do, don't go great. It's not all on him, but you know how that works when, when things are going right, they set the quarterback first. That's how it works. <laughs> so like the next memory was I get told on a Monday night, I'm starting on a Thursday night and I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right. I'm like, let's just take the challenge. I got one day to prepare and we'll do the best we can. And um, so we played Denver on Thursday night football. And I'll just, I'll never forget coming out of the tunnel uh, on national television, like first time like that. 
uh, for the Browns. Like that was a pretty special moment. And uh, I played pretty well. First touchdown pass was to Kellen. He caught one later on in that game. Uh, close game. We were up. You know, Cutler uh, mounted a nice little comeback. They came back and ended up winning it in the end. But um, just that that whole experience, it gave me a lot of confidence kind of moving forward, um, at least with that staff, that regime mm-hmm. uh, in Cleveland, who got all fired at the end of that season. Um, you know, I, I played a couple more games. I broke my uh, right index finger, my throwing hand. Had to have pins put in, and then that was kind of it for um, Romeo Cornell there and Phil Savage and everyone else who drafted me. So, well, as you moved on to to different teams, in the back of your mind, are you thinking, "Hey, you know, I love this game. What what can I do after I retire? What can I do? I mean, where, where did this idea of becoming an analyst or a broadcaster come from?" Honestly, it was uh, it came after probably my lowest lows. Um, so in my seventh year, I was um, originally I was with Seattle that offseason. Okay. Uh, this is back in 2013. And I'm obviously with Pete Carroll, you know, which was I, I got the job. They had me, Matt Liner um, and two other quarterbacks come out, Seneca Wallace and one other that I can't remember off the top of my head. We all went out. And it was the most unique thing I've ever done. They had us basically like Matt and I threw side by side at a workout. And then they had Seneca and the other quarterback come side by side and throw at a workout. And they just picked one of us. And they, they and Pete Pete ended up picking me. Like as soon as I saw Matt there, I'm like, they're not gonna pick me. Like, like they, they, they won a national championship with this dude. Like, no chance. And so after we get done, you know, John Snyder pulls me up to his office. He's like, Hey, we thought you looked great, we throw great. Uh, we'd really like you to be kind of back up here. So they bring me in and I talked to Pete and uh, the rest is, is kind of history. We, I, I was there for free agency all through the end of, end of last cuts. Um, they ended up choosing to go with Tavares Jackson. Okay. So I got released and then the jets call right away. And they're like, Hey, you know, Mark Sanchez is hurt. we got this young rookie. We'd like you to come in and back him up, uh, you know, help teach him and kind of prepare him week to week. So I slept on it and they called it back the next day. I was like, all right, I'll, t- I'll take the opportunity to come out there and kind of see how things go. And not knowing it was going to be a full year thing, but okay. just for a period of time. And so halfway through the season, they ended up releasing me. And then literally I'm, I'm leaving the facility and the Rams call. And they're like, hey, Sam Bradford tore his ACL, ACL again. We need you to fly here right now and, uh, and, and come try to you know, compete for a you know, backup or potentially starter. So this is like where I'm like, all right, I mean, year seven, I bounced around some teams now, nothing's worked out. Like, this is it. This is my opportunity. So the first week I get out there, Kellen Clements is the starter. Uh, we're actually playing Seattle, a team that I knew their offense. They're trying to tell me what they're doing scouting. I was like, you're just go. I was like, I'll, I'll this. <laughs> like, like I, I ran this for five months. Like I, I, can, oh. I, I can, I'll teach you guys about their offense. So we ended up uh, losing the game. And they start giving me reps the next week. And so in practice, in, in the weight room um, that next week, you know, we practiced and all that. Uh, they're like, hey, do you want to back squat? I'm like, all right, sure. Yeah, I'll warm up. I haven't back squatted in like over a year or anything like that. And so I start to warm up and I end up herniating two discs in my back. Like just oh, freaky, shit. like terrible luck. Um, and so, you know, I go get an MRI. They're like, yep, you know, you're, you're going to need surgery on this. So I end up going to IR. And, um, when I was laid up on IR, Jeff Fisher at one point was like, hey, you know, when you're re- recovering, he's like, you should think about trying to do some broadcasting. He's like, I think you might be good at that. And so I was like, all right. And so I hit up my agent. They set me up with someone. I did, you know, the whole ESPN car wash. I did what was called the broadcast boot camp. And then Fox offered me an opportunity to um, basically call five NFL, five college games, do some TV work. And uh, the rest is kind of history. I kind of, really? I jumped into it. Um, I jumped into it. And then the Dolphins, the Dolphins called. I actually, I worked out for the Patriots. And then the Dolphins called the next day. I went in, worked out. They signed me a contract. I told Fox. Um, I was like, I want to try to do this. I want to try to go back in. And I was living in South Florida at the time. So it made sense. Right. And the next day I called them. And I said, hey, they're going to cut me. I was like, I didn't get a rep today in practice. So I was like, clearly they just have me in here as a camp arm. So <laughs> I, I was like, I was like, I hope that opportunity is still there for me at the end. So they cut me at the end of camp. And then that next week starts college football. So I was in uh, Dallas. No, I was in Fort Worth for TCU, Minnesota. 
um, calling that game with Tim Brando. <laughs> so that was, and the rest was history. Like I started calling games from then on out. I uh, really never had any legitimate opportunities, and 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 that was it. That's amazing, man. I mean, so like, like, what do you? If you're a former player, that I mean, it's kind of thinking about this. I mean, is it you know, hey, go this route, go to the ESPN boot camp, go. I mean, are opportunities out there that exist for former players like that? Yeah, the, the NFL broadcast boot camp is a great way to start because you're going to get an idea of if this is something that you want to do. Mm-hmm. For those who aren't, you know, media majors or people who uh, understand they want to do this once they're done. So that would be the first step, I'd say, is just to understand it, like, what this job is about and then make contacts, network. Uh, there's a lot of people in this business and they're always looking at trying to, um, you know, get new, fresh, fresh faces and people involved. There's a lot of new mediums with the digital realm really, sure. really, you know, coming up. So there's a lot more opportunity, but I would say do all you can, you know, um, whether it's, you know, podcasting or taking every radio interview you can. I think one of the biggest things that most guys struggle with is, you know, you, you, when you do this job, you have to be very conscious of what you're saying. And a lot of times what happens is we do it a little bit on a podcast or we do it on a radio interview Or maybe we do it for a TV segment, but then we relax in our normal everyday life. And we start then using fillers and we start not being so conscious or or very critical of what we're saying, how we're saying it or presenting it. And the reality is for us who played sports all our life, we have to catch up with like everyone else who's your play by play and your host and all these other people who they've spent their entire life preparing themselves to speak in a manner which is easily to digest via TV and radio. So my biggest piece of advice for people who want to get into any sort of media involving broadcasting is practice, even in your personal moments, talking to your wife, your girl, your boys, whatever the case is, talk in a manner in which you want to talk on TV, like be able to do that. So it comes so naturally on TV that in those moments of uh, uncertainty or discomfort, you're still going to speak in a way that sounds good on TV, sounds good the way the executives want you to sound. Or, or they think you should sound and ends up being something that, you know, is, is allows you to excel in the business because the biggest thing you hear is, Oh, he's not polished. He's not, he's not polished. Right. What does that right. mean? It means you haven't learned how to communicate yet on TV. And a lot of that can be done by practicing when you're not on radio, when you're not on TV, when you're not on a podcast. So that's honestly my biggest piece of advice with this. You can really practice for this career all the time. It just takes you being conscious about doing it. Wow. Well, and you've evolved to actually a radio show now, and then you've you have one of the coveted um, in studio seats with Fox, and, and I think that's amazing because I mean I don't think I don't think folks know there are thousands of guys, thousands of former players that want to throw their hat into broadcasting, right? I mean, being an yeah. analyst for a game, and either you have a chance to do it, you get that call, or you don't. And you've kind of you've been able to kind of evolve to allow you to to kind of be in the studio. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So they're two completely different, you know, realms, right? I mean, calling a game, it's it's easier, I think, for for players because it's very much like preparing for an opponent. You know, I think I think it's easier for quarterbacks because you have to p- prepare on such a global level, right? You're looking at situations, you're looking at blitzes, coverages, et cetera, fronts, how it all plays a part. So the game portion of it really just became, all right, I'm going to prepare for this like I'm a quarterback preparing for both defenses. And then I'm going to look at things on offense as far as tendencies that they like. And then special teams, I'll kind of look at some things here or there to pull from. Studio is different. You know, I would say it's studio is more like digging an inch deep and a mile wide. Doing a game is more like digging a mile deep, inch wide. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very different approach. And, and really it's more entertainment. Like I've always felt like, a game is I am here to inform, educate, and tell the stories of these young men and the coaches on the field. And then and really in college, you know, bring the light some positivity or in the NFL, like remind people these are the best in the world. Sure. Um, I think sometimes we tend to be a little too negative, or at least I, when I listen to broadcasts where guys are really negative, I'm like, they sound bitter or they just, they sound like they're not having fun with it. And they should be. Right. When you're in studio, it's like, it, it's more entertaining. Like you got to kind of be, you got to kind of have your opinion. You've got to be able to deliver it in a way that will get people saying, wait, what did he just say? Or, okay, now I'm going to listen to what he's just saying because the way he just kind of 
brought me in with the hook. Mm-hmm. So you got to be able to present it in a, in a manner that, that really draws people's attention. And I think, you know, speaking in a way that's, that a lot of people are, are, are going to say, you know, I, I, they either love you or hate you. Like right. that's the one thing. And I think every Notre Dame guy can, can, can be a part of that is you, you want to be loved or hate. You want to move someone. Like I don't care if people hate me or hate my opinions and all that. That's fine. Cause here's the reality is you're still going to watch because right. people love to be upset and argue and hate. So that's fine. If, if, and, and, I'll, and I'll take those opinions all day. I'd, I'd rather you love me, but if that's not the case, so be it. Like I'll, I'll gladly, <laughs> you know, go ahead and, and be the bad guy or, or be the guy that, you know, you don't like that's a part of the show. That, that, that works for me too. The last thing you don't want, you don't want to be as indifferent. Uh, right. Or people feel indifferent about you. Uh, that's where it's going to be a losing battle for you. Well, one of the moments that you kind of talk about having fun, um, at one point it was you, Reggie Bush, Matt Liner and um uh the coach uh urban meyer yeah urban meyer. and so they start talking about the bush push and everything and you know not, not only did you have a great comeback but <clears throat> having a chance to kind of be in that environment a lot of people of course you know diehards would say oh how could you be friends or how could you work i mean you respect each other because you guys are great athletes but right. i think it was a great time can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Because I know Reggie brought out a shirt and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, look, I mean, we've obviously have known each other forever. Um, you know, I called Reggie, tried to recruit him at Notre Dame. Uh, but as I always say, it, it just USC had, had a better pitch. It just involved a, a little <laughs> bit more to their recruiting pitch than what mine was. Uh, and, then, and then Matt and I obviously have a lot in common, you know, um, especially as he's gotten married and his family has grown and I've gotten married and my family's grown. Um, you know, we've really, we've really grown to be good friends throughout all this. So we see a lot more eye to eye than, than different, even though sure. we grew up, you know, competing against one another. Uh, but there's still those like open wounds that will always be there, man. <laughs> and, like the bush bush is one of them because, you know, it, it was a play that to them, they knew it was illegal, but they don't care because they got the win. <laughs> we're, we're, we're like, wait a second. And this is Notre Dame. They're probably throwing a flag on us. So, um, <laughs> So Reggie, obviously, being the uh, very entrepreneurial spirit and mind that he is, he uh, he went ahead and made sure to make some T-shirts um, that talked about the Bush push and probably had his big face on there and all that. I didn't even look at the T-shirt. I just I immediately took it and threw it in the trash can um, as soon as I got it. So I don't even know what the T-shirt looks like, but uh, it, it's it's sitting in the, uh, the garbage dump somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, it just kind of shows you kind of what the type of relationship – that you have with your colleagues. And even though like literally years and years before that, you wanted to rip each other's heads off, but at the end of the day, I mean, you, you respect them because they are athletes as well. So that, I thought that was that was a great piece I saw when I was doing some of the research. I mean, it was great because they had like a little cartoon going on and yeah. kind of talking about how they, they came to our name stadium and it was all ruckus and it was crazy. And I'm sure they loved it because they won, so. Oh yeah, well, and here's the thing is, You'll never find when I'm on Fox anything Notre Dame related because all the people behind the scenes are USC alums. So <laughs> they do everything they can to hype up USC back in when Matt and Reggie were there because they've stunk since. So oh that's, my God. that's more of the issue is is you got all these people behind the scenes who are USC alums that are just trying to glorify that because that's all they have to rely on. Like they haven't been a part of the playoff. They haven't been in the running for anything. So. Oh. Um, that's that's the reality of, of, of where a lot of the digital stuff comes from and everything behind the scenes with all the people who are, who are working on the show. That is hilarious. Now, now, you have a family, broadcasting, got a radio show, going to school. Um, uh, several years ago, you started a, <clears throat> a not-for-profit organization, and it's called uh, Third and Goal. Can you tell us a little bit about that and kind of why it's why it's important to you? Yeah. So uh, first off, I'll kind of explain the title and the name. So third and goal, which really from Charlie Weiss to Romeo Cornell to Josh McDaniels and Eric Mangini and every you know everyone along the New England Patriots coaching tree, they all really specialized in situational awareness coming from Bill Belichick. And one of the things that they key on is the difference on third and goal because throughout the course of the game 
it's the subtle difference of getting a stop on defense and forcing a field goal or scoring a touchdown, that four point difference, right? That four point swing from seven to three, it adds up and it makes the difference in the game. So it was something that they harped on. It was something that they emphasized. And I thought for me, it was fitting because it, it's, it's, we're interjecting in the lives of veterans at a critical point in time. Now it's not, uh, you know, last ditch, ditch effort. It's not fourth and goal. It's not, you know, a Hail Mary, for example. Right. right. It's, it's, periodical moments throughout time in which are extremely important for the success of these individuals. And that's where the third and goal name comes from, but okay. it's all in support of veterans. You know, we have three main missions, uh, operation, education, operation, home and operation, joy, operation, education. We put on educational platforms, uh, for uh, veterans who are looking to start, finish or continue their education operation home. We do home remodels. Uh, for those veterans who are wounded in, in warfare or those who have had debilitating injuries uh, and then operation joy and really we're just serving and helping out uh, veteran families in need throughout the calendar year uh, those are our three main missions it's been inspired by my father who was a marine in vietnam uh, my grandfather on his side who was in the tank brigade in world war ii um, it's uh, it all really stems from from my family and serving and that's where um, you know, I, I just, I feel extremely blessed, um, and, and fortunate to have been able to play sports, you know, which I feel like I've never worked a day in my life. Meanwhile, you've got brave young men and women, you know, serving and protecting our liberties and freedoms. So I, I only felt right to give back and, uh, we're going into our 11th year now. So I've had it for mm. 11 years and, uh, it's been a lot of fun. That's fabulous. Kiki. Can you share a story with us? Because I know that, um, I mean, when, you have an opportunity to kind of help out. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's gratifying, but you, you kind of learn so much in the process. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a story about someone you helped? Yeah. So Sergeant Shane Parsons is really the first one that comes to mind. He's from Foster, Ohio. Uh, he was one of our, our, our first, um, our first recipients. Uh, we, we call them touchdowns, uh, which is our, some of our projects, but uh, he needed a entry and an exit way that was handicap accessible for him. Uh, he was hit with an IED during his service and it forced him to have both his legs amputated. And so uh, we were able to connect with him. We were able to help out and, you know, able to build those ramps. My dad actually was able to, you know, help out with the construction of it and kind of organize really? all that. Yeah. <laughs> which awesome. is, which is, that's more the touching part to it as well, especially on the projects in Ohio is, you know, watching my dad, a former, you know, a veteran, really share and talk about and discuss different stories with those who serve too. So wow. um, it's, it's pretty neat to see the camaraderie between the two, but uh, Sergeant Shane was our first one. He, he was always a rock star for us. He'd come back and uh, come to our events and, and he'd talk about the foundation. He'd talk about his service and how it happened. Um, you know, he was actually getting off of rotation and the other person who we actually he was kind of wired, didn't want to go to sleep that night and said he'd go back out for his buddy on patrol. And so he, he stayed up, you know, got right back in the Humvee. And when they went back out, they got hit with an IED. And that was where he woke up in the hospital, uh, realizing that his life had uh, changed drastically. So uh, he was he was one of our first recipients. You know, we felt incredibly honored just to be able to help him out. Um, the unfortunate thing is now he moved out to the West Coast, but He's doing well. You know, he's out, you know, hunting, doing different things. Um, so he, he's enjoying himself. Well, it has to be obviously gratifying for you, but kind of being able to experience that with your dad and having his background had to be also important as well. A hundred percent. Like I said, I mean, have, being able to have him do the work in part, I feel like he feels you know, fortunate to be able to give back. Uh, and, and two, I know he's going to do it right, you know, so I, I know he's going to be able to help these people out. Uh, so that, that's the other portion of it is, you know, you're not hiring someone that you don't know what kind of job they're going to do. Right. Uh, you know, we, we, we know, we know my dad's going to get the job done right. So um, it, it's, it, it's very fulfilling to be able to share on those experiences with him. Um, it can be stressful at times. As anyone can imagine anytime you're doing a home remodel, it's not, it's not easy. And then working with family is not easy, but, uh, we, we've been able to get, get some of those jobs done and, uh, and help out those veterans in need. You know, it's amazing kind of, when you think about your, your journey and what you've accomplished, um, and you kind of talked about the, the third and goal scenario. Can you share with us kind of some other 
maybe leadership tips, uh, tips on culture that you've been able to kind of learn over the years? Because oftentimes, um, as you mentioned earlier with, with, with class, um, there are things that, that we are able to pick up that we just kind of take for granted. And yeah. other folks may not have a chance to kind of learn those experiences. Could you just share some of those with us? Yeah, I would say, man, I think there's like a few pillars that I really look for in leadership or people who are looking to kind of sharpen or improve their leadership uh, to be a source with communication. And one thing that I'm still trying to improve upon and learn is, you know, how to communicate effectively. I used to always think communicating in a very monotone, you know, simple, directed forward way was the best way to approach it. But, you know, communication is a two way street. And so sure. just because I feel like I'm communicating in a manner that's easy to digest doesn't mean that that individual is going to be able to take that and not think I'm, I'm being a jerk or uh, I'm being abrasive or whatever sure. the term you want to use. And so um, communication to me is still incredibly important. But part of it, too, is having an understanding of listening to the other person and understanding how they like to be you know, communicated to, uh, but also being able to have clear lines of communication. So you're, whether that's being truthful or just being very um, realistic and straightforward with what your intentions are, what your goals are, and, and what your what your uh, job is within that and how you're going to go accomplish that. Uh, so to me, communication is, is pivotal, in understanding who you're communicating to and how mm -hmm. you're communicating to them. Right. Uh, the next one's probably self-awareness and, and, and empathy kind of comes along with that. But I think too often times we aren't like really aware of how we come off or uh, how we are conducting ourselves amongst others and how we're trying to lead others. And right. I think a lot of times when you have empathy, you can have a little bit more of a feel for, you know, what buttons to push with certain people or when to kind of lay off or when to be more complimentary or over the top with others. I, I think there's, there's a bit of uh, self-awareness that comes into play where you have to understand how you're reflected to others and how you're portrayed by others to understand how you're going to be able to lead them. Uh, but having an understanding of, you know, how they operate emotionally is going to be one of the biggest keys in, in all of that. Um, so those are kind of two of them. I, I think the last thing I just say is, um, you know, and people talk about it all the time, talk about grit, but, you know, to me, it's, it's just being able to have kind of a, a relentless sense or pursuit of, of what you want to accomplish and, 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 and not being afraid to fail in doing that. Right. Like right. almost saying like we, we fail, we learn, right. Mm -hmm. You either succeed and you take the next step or we fail, we learn, and then we get better. You know, like it's, it's not looking to take a step back. I think so many people are afraid to fail. It's funny. Like we talked about school at the beginning. I can't get over how many kids are so afraid to answer in class sometimes because they're afraid to be wrong. And I'm like, dude, either you're paying for your MBA, your employer is, <laughs> right. or a bank is, and you took right. out more debt to do this. But either way, like get your money's worth, right? Right. Like get your experience, get your money's worth of this and, and don't be afraid to be wrong. But right. don't be afraid to question things, be wrong, and then mm -hmm. and learn and get better from that. Like that's, you know, that takes maturity. But I think there's a lot of people uh, who are apprehensive and they're scared sometimes to to be wrong because they're scared of failure. But the reality is, you know, you ask anyone who's ever accomplished anything, they probably failed ten times before they right. were able to to succeed. Exactly. Exactly. Um, this has been great. I want to wrap up with one more question, and this is kind of an interesting one that. I enjoy asking, um, can you share with us uh, which mentor or mentors have influenced you probably the most over your life? Yeah. Wow. Um, I would say besides obviously my parents, sure, um, sure. I've, I've got, I've got two uncles who have been incredibly influential. Uh, one of which played college football, uh, helped me for a long portion of period of time and just, kind of growing my understanding of the game and everything else. Uh, he was an off, he was an offensive lineman. So I, I always grew up at a young age, having an appreciation for offensive <laughs> line, defensive line play because so one uncle played at Kentucky, the other one played at Brown, nice. but having, having two uncles who play in the trenches, you, you learn that that's really where the games won and lost. Like that's mm. where the real men are. That's where the real <laughs> skill and talented players are. So like I, I know that coming into it when I'm, you know, 10, 11 years old, but, it takes a lot of those skill guys as prima donnas some time to understand that. Um, but he, he had a huge impact on my life. 
uh, just in helping me through like all of it. I mean, when you get drafted, when you, you know, play at that high of a level, like no one else in my family had really done anything like that before. So you got to have someone to lean on and guide. And I, I talked talk to him countless times and just picked his brain and he always had just sound advice. Um, and then the other uncle is, he's, he's really more of a step uncle is through my grandmother on my mom's side remarrying, but, um, he has been, he's just incredible wealth of knowledge from a business standpoint. And there's a, I, 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 t- I would call it Bender U, Bender University, because he teaches me so many things uh, in the business world and things to look out for. And, and we'll even talk now about broadcasting and, you know, where he thinks that industry is going or, you know, co- contract negotiations, all that. Um, but I, I, I was very lucky to have two people in my life who are obviously close to my family. Mm-hmm. Where, I, where I could, you know, lean on them as mentors. Not a lot of people have that. So I, I realize how fortunate I am in that regard to have two people like that in my life um, that have really been a part of my life for a long time. That's awesome. Man. And, and being able to have them with, well, and then kind of, I guess more importantly, people that you can trust because yeah. that, that person, eventually they may be a mentor for you, but in the beginning, they're just, like everybody else. And when you're in the position you're in, I mean, there's thousands of people coming at you every day. So who can you trust? You know, can I trust this yeah. person? Can I trust this person or, or what? And the, the fact that they're your family kind of helps in that regard. So hundred percent. And if, and if they mess something up, they're going to feel even worse than someone else who is not my family. Right. <laughs> right. I, 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 I get to see them. I get to see them at, at Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, you know, <laughs> give them a hard time about it. You know? <laughs> You hire, that's someone that's, you hire someone that's going to do you wrong. I mean, you never see them again. You know, they're out the door. <laughs> you're, you're, see, you're seeing them next week. So, Oh, man, dude, this has been great, man. Thank you so much for – I really, really appreciate you having a chance to kind of take all time. And I know that um, got classes and stuff like that, got family. So really, really do appreciate it. And, and more so because – and I've had the chance to kind of – see you moderate i've been involved with some things and you're really just a great example of kind of what notre dame produces because i mean not only are we able to produce scholars and great athletes but having a chance to kind of i mean really be one of a handful of people who actually have a chance to kind of talk about the game that you love is great and that opportunity for folks that don't know, it's not everybody can't just walk into the position you're in. And and I don't think you've, you've given yourself enough credit. I mean, you've accomplished a lot in a very, very short period of time. Yeah, no. And, and, and I've been blessed. I mean, look, I, I think I've been lucky too. you know, bottom line is there's, um, you know, people ask you how you do certain things and then they'll try to do them and they're like, oh, it's not working out for me. The reality is all you can do is constantly prepare for when that next potential opportunity comes and be open to doing things and seeing where they go. Um, you know, I, I was open to listening to Jeff Fisher, a coach who I barely, I didn't really play for. I just, just got there, just signed. He wow. sees me around the facility. He kind of says that to me. It leads now to a career. So I, I would just, you know, tell people that, you know, continue to keep preparing whatever your dream is, whatever you want to do, can you continue to keep preparing like that opportunity has come around that next corner because it, it very well may be. And if you ever stop preparing, that to me is when you don't find that pot of gold, where you don't find that luck on the other side. You know, the people who don't work as hard, don't prepare as hard, they tend to be not as lucky as, 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 as the other people who do. <laughs> very true, very true. Well, again, Notre Dame is very lucky to have you as, as an alum. So I, I, I thank you on, on their behalf. I'd also like to thank everyone watching and listening to this edition of the Zorch Podcast. Conversations with Leaders and Legends. I'd like to thank my wife, who is also my producer and director, because I still don't know what the hell I'm doing sometimes. Uh, <laughs> uh, this podcast, you do a great the- job. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. You do a great Coming job. from you, that means something, so thank you. Um, this podcast, along with our other podcasts, you can check out at my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chriszort50, as well as on Apple Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Also, please check out the list um, in our description because we have books from Amazon from folks who've been on the show like Coach Holtz, Joe Montana, and Jerome Bettis and others. Brady, this was awesome, man. This was really, really cool. I learned a bunch about you, but a little bit more importantly, I hope, I hope our audience 
has they had a chance to kind of look a little bit beyond kind of what they thought they knew about you. So thank you very yeah. much for being on. Chris, thank you for the opportunity, man. And like I said, to, to start this whole thing, man, you, you were a legend. Um, you know, you, you're one of those players that made it special, put the gold helmet on. You guys set the standard and, and set the bar, and we all just tried to kept pushing it higher and higher and higher. So um, I, I hope you understand how all of us appreciated watching you when we were young and, and really setting the standard for the rest of us coming in there. Well, thank you, man. I'm honored. Thank you very much, man. Go Irish. Go Irish. <laughs>